Thank you so much for joining us today, and please join me in welcoming our speaker, Nancy Mull Matthews. Thank you, Kristen. Um, thanks, Kristen and Liz, for arranging my trip here. Um, and uh, thank you, Katie Hansen, for doing that nice exhibition of the uh, French pastels that I hope everyone has seen. Uh, if not, after the, immediately after this lecture, um, it's part of this, the course. There will be a quiz. Uh, you, you will need to go and take another look at that exhibition, but I'm sure you've seen it by now. You know that you are my favorite audience. <laughs> um, and I want to remind you of a lecture that I gave here two years ago, almost three, in the spring of 2016. Does anybody remember going to this lecture? <coughs> it was a course, and I gave it twice, those are the dates, and it was about Mary Cassatt and the art of thinking. So, <coughs> What I realized was, in being invited back to talk about the pastels, I was doing something almost diametrically opposed to what I had talked about two years ago. Uh, this is from that lecture, this slide, where we were taking a look at, we were looking at Mary Cassatt looking at looking, <clears throat> and thinking about looking, and essentially the sense of sight and how it was connected to the thought process, how thinking and looking went together. Today, <laughs> we're going to look at and think about the sense of touch, which is, in terms of all of the senses, kind of diametrically opposed to the sense of sight, in that the people who have the most developed, according to scientists and studies of the sense of touch, the people who have the most developed sense of touch are those people without sight. So the people who make their living from sight, like artists, you would think would have the least developed sense of touch. But in fact, there is a whole category of people for whom sight and touch are closely related. And <clears throat> that's usually the people who have good hand-eye coordination. So think about those people, athletes. I saw John, a film about John McEnroe up here, particularly athletes who do racket sports. The hand-eye coordination is extraordinary. Um, think about surgeons to whom sight and touch are intimately related and very highly developed. And artists fall into this category. And I like to look at this particular photograph of Mary Cassatt that I'm showing you right now, which was taken in Parma, Italy in 1872, <clears throat> because her hand is very close to her eyes. And the two seem to be, in my mind, connected. So in, if you look up touch in Wikipedia, my favorite source for all information. <laughs> Even art historical, I have to tell you, I support Wikipedia. I don't know about you all, but um, it is a worthy endeavor. And I find that the information is very well documented and extremely reliable. So I go there for everything, but particularly I go there for scientific information. If you look up touch in Wikipedia, you are involved in all of the somatic senses. 
but particularly three that we will be looking at today. One is the sense of touch as we normally understand it, which is how your epidermis, your skin, which is the largest sensory, um, uh, the largest sensory uh, attribute of human beings, how that relates, how that works in terms of touch. And the fact that the highest concentration of sensory uh, receptors are in your fingers, particularly your index finger. So we'll be looking at fingers. Then um, proprioception, or the sense of position and movement, because uh, the sense of touch relates to your entire skin, the epidermis, but also the, the coverings of all your internal organs. It relates to how you move and how you balance and the gestures that make us effective as human beings. And finally, the third category has to do with haptic communication, which is touch related to other creatures, um, but particularly to other people, how we communicate through touch. Particularly, not just with our hands, but with our whole bodies. So, we start with the fingers. The fingers are ta have tactile corpuscles, according to Gray's Anatomy, which, by the way, was published first in 1858. So Gray's Anatomy, the book, I'm not talking about the TV show, <coughs> is what would have been the source of scientific information for Mary Cassatt's generation. And scientists had already determined that the nerve endings in the skin, particularly in the fingers, is responsible for sensitivity to light touch. And they're most concentrated in thick, hairless skin, especially the finger pads. It doesn't mention, but the other place on your body that has the highest concentration of tactile corpuscles are your lips, but primarily your fingers. So what I would like to propose today is that the medium of pastel is the most like using your fingers to touch the color and the paper that creates a pastel. In a way, it's like finger painting. Remember back when you used to do finger painting? In that the pigment is right on your fingers and you're using your fingers to apply that pigment directly to the paper. And just think about how different it is from other media where you actually, where the pigment is applied to the canvas or the paper with some other kind of instrument, like a brush or a pen or a pencil. But today, we're looking specifically at the media that go directly. You hold the pigment in your hands and put it directly onto the paper. And I'm showing you a box of pastels, relatively unused, uh, from about 1900. The kind of pastels you would have bought at an art supply store in Paris, Sennelier pastels, the best artist quality pastels. And you get the sense of the sticks of pastels, of the pastel itself and how much they look like fingers themselves. And they're arranged neatly when you buy them in color, in colors, in a, a kind of prism-like or spectrum-like effect. And you then take your fingers, your hands, and work with them directly. 
Pastels, as we know them today, were manufactured first in the Renaissance, although the use of sticks of color, of course, goes back to prehistoric times. Whether it's burnt charcoal or whether it's natural chalk um, dug up from the ground, uh, the cave paintings, many of them, are executed with some kind of pigment that comes off of a, a, har a substance, a, a stick or a piece. But in the Renaissance, in the 15th century, people started taking the ground pigments that they had been using to paint with, either putting them in water for watercolor or egg for tempera or oil painting, they began manufacturing this kind of stick that the artists, it's exactly the same kind of pigment that you would find in oil paint, but instead of oil, it's bound together with a kind, usually with some sort of glue. And you take your hand and you use that stick. And it was a real um, boon for artists because it was excellent for making colored sketches that were in preparation for a fresco or for um, an altarpiece or a finished work of art. And throughout the, the intervening centuries, pastels were manufactured. In the 18th century, they began being used more and more for finished works of art. And we'll look at that a little bit later. <clears throat> but in the 19th century, the sources of natural pigments began to dry up. And better living through chemistry in the 19th century, um, chemists began manufacturing pigments that were artificial, that were not coming from natural sources. And so in the 19th century, there was an explosion of new colors, new um, uh, glues to hold the pigments together, and also new kinds of paper, uh, sometimes made out of wood pulp rather than the, the cloth-based papers of the past. So, for artists of the 19th century, like the ones that are in that exhibition, pastels, uh, the door was open to all kinds of experimentation and um, a greater flexibility than it ever had before. When we look at a box of pastels that has been used by an artist, in a way, you can, by looking at it, recreate in your mind that artist's process. For instance, you can look at which of the colors have been used the most. I mean, they're just little tiny stubs, for instance, of the reds um, and the purples. I love this little section here. This is, by the way, upstairs. And I mean, not, is it upstairs? Where is it? Is it on this floor? Right around the corner, right? Kind of around the corner, okay. Um, but look at this little part of the box here. Just a little nubbins. This was her box of pastels, one of them. You can see that she, when she used pastels, she really used them. She used them up. Um, and so she would then have to go out and buy another box of pastels. And so she had all these old used box of pastels. It's not that easy to buy individual sticks. It's easier to go out and buy a whole new set. Uh, and so, you know, when they got to this point, she would try to find somebody else to give them to, which is um, the case with, with this particular box. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you think, where did all that red go? <laughs> where did all this purple go over here? Um, in the bottom, there are little nubbins of green. So you're in your mind, you're looking at this and seeing essentially the hand of the artist, how that artist created the works of art from this box of pastels. There are other boxes of pastels. Three of them are in the National Gallery. 
Um, and you can see that two of them are similar, um, Sennelier boxes of pastels. The third one is a different manufacturer. And these aren't nice and neat <laughs> like the one um, here at the MFA. Uh, and probably because the person she, ga she gave these to actually used them. And um, they're not exactly the way. The, uh, the one here is more representative, we think, of her working process than this particular set of pastels. Where did those pastels go? Obviously, they went onto the paper. And literally, you use up the medium. You, it goes like, if you imagine, if we're using the metaphor of a pastel as a finger, those fingers are now on the paper. Literally, the hand of the artist has gone right onto the paper itself. So having the box of pastels and having the, the finished products themselves gives us this incredible closeness to the artist and how she used her fingers, how she used her hands, how this ended up as finally a work of art. I mean, we use that term all the time, the hand of the artist. This gives us a really dramatic, graphic sense of how that hand of the artist got onto the pastel itself. Why pastel? She started out as an oil painter. And you can see on the left, an early work of hers from 1873, painted in Seville. But even in the oil paint, from a very early age, and you know, she signed up. She was accepted to go to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts when she was 15. And the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts was, it, it was in a rivalry with the National Academy of Design, which was in New York. The Pennsylvania Academy was in Philadelphia. But these were the two best art schools in this country in the 1860s, when she was, well, in 1860, when she was looking to become an artist. So she had known from an early age that she wanted to do it, and God bless them, her parents let her. She was 15, she wasn't even finished with high school yet, and they let her drop out of school and begin going to art school. Of course, you had to be 16 to go, so she had signed up and was accepted at 15, but then started after her birthday um, in May uh, and was 16 when she started. She, from an early age, um, was um, considered to have what was called talent of the brush. And you can see in the, the painting itself what um, the French would call the, the touche or even the tosh, the two words are closely related. The touche, meaning touch, translated loosely into English meaning touch, but it means um, a dab, a dab of paint. And when you look at the, the decoration on the Toreador's costume, it's just little dabs of paint. Even in his face, you see little dabs of paint. So she gravitated toward this uh, from the beginning in her oil painting. But then, when she became acquainted with the Impressionists, she, it seems as if, because we don't know of any pastels before that time, uh, and she um, presumably became uh, personally acquainted with them in 1877, when she was invited to uh, begin ex exhibiting with them. They believed that they would have had an exhibition in 1878. It turned out that they didn't, so her first actual Impressionist exhibition was in 1879. But it gave her a couple of years to study the work of the other Impressionist artists. Um, and we know, um, of course, that she was particularly interested in Degas' work, but she was also interested in, and very close to, Pizarro who was a very welcoming 
um, member of the Impressionist group, all the, newcomer, all the newcomers to the group gravitated to Pizarro. And there's a very nice, uh, this one is in the exhibition, um, and you can, you can see who she would be looking at when she did this portrait of Monsieur Dreyfus uh, in 1878, 1879, and this would have been her pastel, would have been exhibited in the exhibition of, of 1879, her first exhibition of, um, th with the Impressionist group. Impressionist pastel was closely associated with the theory of Impressionism, which was that you were to look at life afresh. And one of the greatest theorists of Impressionism was a guy named Edmond Duranty. He wrote a, a what was published separately um, as a pamphlet called The New Painting, Nouvelle Peinture. And in that, uh, you know, oddly enough, what he asserts, one of his main points, is that Impressionism, or the new painting, is actually the new drawing. And particularly in the drawing media, prints, pastels, you find color and line rejoined. Because Duranty and the Impressionists were the product of the debate or the, the conflict between the, the romantics and the classics or the idealists, between, between um, someone like uh, Delacroix and someone like Ang, where color and line were separate. That if you were in one school, you did concentrate on line. If you were in the other school, the Delacroix school, you concentrated on color. But with Impressionism, with the new painting, the idea was that they were rejoining color and line. And no better medium to do this but pastel. Um, I'm, again, showing you this Degas pastel is, up, is in the exhibition as well. Uh, and you can see how Mary Cassatt, in her pastel on the left, is really adopting some of the techniques that Degas used in his, um, in his, impression, in his pastel technique. Um, Bert Morisot uh, was also exhibiting pastels and experimenting with the medium. And Degas, in 1879, did his famous portrait of Edmond Duranty who um, was, you know, was someone that the Impressionist artists were really trying to follow, trying to um, work with the ideas. One of the things that Duranty said about, about Impressionist drawing design was, it is the joining of a torch with a pencil. You can imagine the light coming in with the pencil. He said, with a back, we want to reveal a temperament, an age, a social state. With a pair of hands, we must express a magistrate or a shopkeeper. With a gesture, a whole array of feelings. And this idea that the touch, the drawing, the hand of the artist could express feelings, corresponds to the idea of touch as able to express feelings. It's called, it's actually called affective touch, where touch elicits emotion. It's not just a sensory you know, pleasure or pain, but an actual emotion. And that is the idea that Degas and Cassatt and Morisot and Pizarro were trying to get with their pastels. Not only pastels, but with prints as well. And I'm showing you here um, three prints by Cassatt, Degas, and Pizarro done very closely together with the three of them 
where they're applying line, this is primarily etching, dry point and etching, and aquatint in order to try to create a color so that the idea of the line as expressive could be communicated in many, many different kinds of media. And Cassatt, who started out being someone, an artist, who people didn't really think of as a draftsman, and she herself was not that interested in drawing. She was more interested in painting. As she works with Pizarro and Degas, particularly on the prints, they were going to publish them as a, a print journal um, in 1879. It didn't happen, but they still worked a lot together. Later, she would take her biographer around her house, and she pointed to this particular print and said, that is what teaches you to draw. This is when she really begins devoting herself to the concept of drawing, to making sure that the hand of the artist, the line, become the central to her, to her artistic style. And in fact, I don't know if you're going to be able to um, see this, but I will read, uh, read it to you. Um, as she exhibits with the Impressionist, and as her reputation becomes international, this is what is, was said about her in uh, the actual newspaper is the St. Louis Dispatch, Post Dispatch, but it's, the article is from the wire service from the New York world, but this is going all over the US. This um, article about women artists, and this, presumably, the picture was based on a photograph of Mary Cassatt, although we, the photograph is lost and we hardly recognize her, but it's still interesting to see that people in St. Louis in 1885 were seeing this picture of her and this description of her work. It says, Miss Cassatt paints in the impressionistic manner, and it occasionally betrays her into obscurities of touch, which do her pictures no good. But she has a powerful command of the resources of drawing, and at her best is very fine indeed. So this, by 1885, she has gotten the reputation for her draftsmanship and for her touch. She said about pastels, she said, uh, or she told people, and this is in another article from the US about her, many of her most important works are painted in pastel, which is her favorite mode of expression as in it, she is able to obtain beautiful harmony of line to which she devotes great attention. So we're looking now at what her pa actual pastel technique was about and how in the 1880s and 1890s, as her command of pastel increased, her mastery of this medium, how she was able to use it as experimentation, which echoes another line of Durantis, which was that line is the indivisible companion of the idea. And with experimentation, being able to see the hand of the artist, being able to see the work evolve in front of your eyes, you actually get to see the idea develop that the artist has in mind, that she is experimenting with it in many, many different ways. And so, as you know from the, uh, now unfortunately, the MFA's pastel, which is the one on the right, is no longer up in the show because um, it's very fragile and can't be on view for very long. Uh, but you're all familiar with it, I'm sure. You've seen it probably, if not in person, reproduced many times. And you know that it's related to uh, a major pastel of the banjo player. The banjo player motif, subject, actually comes from and seems to be first um, on view 
In her modern woman mural that she painted for the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, this is a mural for the Women's Building of the Chicago World's Fair. And her mural, the title of it is Modern Woman, where she shows women in the central panel plucking fruit from the tree of knowledge. Here is the alleg allegorical scene and a reference to women's education by 1893, which was very, um, very much in vogue. Most of the women's colleges that we know today were founded by 1893. Um, and on the right, there is a scene of women in the arts, a woman dancing, a woman playing the banjo here, and then a woman who is observing who we take to be the artist, who's, who's looking at the other two arts. So this is the, seems to be, the first version of the banjo player. But we already saw the two pastels. There is, in addition, a color print of the banjo player. And now, okay, you've got to follow me here. Printmaking creates a mirror image. So if she drew this in the same direction as the um, mural, which is the same direction we see here, the print would have been reversed. The you know, mirror image, it's not. So that makes us question whether it was the mural that was the first finished work of art. Maybe it was the print because they're facing in the same direction. And we suppose, because the two pastels are facing in the same direction, that they are after the print as well. So we're, because she's doing this subject in so many different media and experimenting with them in each case and making them all a little bit different, we're trying to follow her creative process. And she exhibited many times the early states of prints, exhibited early sketches and finished works, pastels and oils, so that the creative process, following the hand of the artist, was something that she cared very much about. It's even more confusing because we have two, not one, but two counterproofs of this pastel. A counterproof is kind of like a print. Uh, it's a little bit more like a monotype in that you put the medium, the paint or the pastel, onto one surface, in this case, a pa paper, and then you pass it through a press and the excess comes off on another sheet of paper that has been moistened so that it's receptive to the extra pastel. Again, you have a mirror image, just like any any print. And so that's what you're seeing here. So this is what she used to make the counterproof, both counterproofs. And they don't seem, the counterproofs don't seem to have any extra pastel on them. Um, they're just the residue or, or lifted pastel from the, from the original pastel itself. But if you do a counterproof, imagine in printmaking, if you make a print off of a, a piece of copper with, with ink on it, you take the ink off and it ends up on the paper, not on the plate. So the same thing is true with pastels. If you make a counterproof, then the original pastel is going to have less pastel. So what we have here is Mary Cassatt after these counterproofs were made, going back to the original pastel and adding more pastel. <laughs> it's just mind boggling to figure out what she's doing, how many different versions she's making 
how many times she goes back to the idea and tries to make the idea the indivisible companion to the line, the print as well. It was, it was extraordinary for her and, and a, a practice that other impressions were using as well. Degas, of course, makes counterproofs also, um, and as well as monotypes. Um, and so were, you know, um, this was part of that whole impressionist idea. This is the pastel that this um, on the on the left is the pastel that is up there now. Uh, I hope you've seen it. It is also a counterproof in that this was the original pastel. This was passed through a press with another sheet of paper. And then after it was put through the press, you have two images, one a mirror image of the other. In this case, it looks to me as if the paper wasn't placed properly on the press, or the two sheets of paper were not lined up. Because as you can see, this whole bottom down here is missing over here. I mean, it's possible that it was cut off. But, um, and there seems to be a little extra room at the top. As if, to me, you know, I'm just guessing that it just got misplaced. The paper, the two pieces of paper weren't lined up properly. Uh, but in both cases, she went back and added pastel. She clearly had to add more pastel for this one to be as rich and vivid as it is today. Um, but she also added pastel to this in a much more delicate way, trying to create two different versions, two different outcomes um, to this whole process. Now, <clears throat> I talk about her doing this herself, and <clears throat> it's quite possible that she did because she had her own press, and she, she was a very strong person, um, and could, I don't know if you've ever seen an etching press, but they're really hard, it, re it requires a lot of strength. It's a huge wheel, and you turn the wheel, and that passes the, the plate through the press and, and exerts pressure so that the plate and the paper are pressed into one another, and that's how these are done. But, but um, it's not that easy to do. <coughs> Actually, she may have done this one because it didn't come out just right. Um, there were, um, the uh, dealer, Vollard, uh, worked with a printer who specialized in this. <clears throat> and um, it's possible that she was, she and Vollard were planning to make um, lithographs from this whole project. Although none were ever made, and we don't know. We just don't know what was happening with these. But it's still, it's um, so interesting that she's using the pastels for this extra kind of experimentation. Past, uh, gestures. And again, I like this photograph of her because she is, it's almost an artificial gesture. She is very artificial in this photograph. If you see other photographs of her, her hair is straight. She, she did not have curly hair. This is either a wig or she has spent a lot of time in a beauty salon because the, her hair did not do this naturally. Um, she also has these amazing earrings, um, you know, the fichu, the little scarf around her neck with all the fringe a velvet dress, you know, she is really, she did it for this photograph. She knew she was going to get her, pho her photograph done that day. And she sits there in this very sort of almost 18th century pose. It's so, um, so refined looking, almost self-conscious, very self-conscious. And I like to compare it to, <laughs> I mean, we all get there, right? This is us. <laughs> We're getting there. <clears throat> this is 
she died when she was almost 82. Um, and this was taken about the time, uh, or you know, the, probably in the last year of her life. But again, look at her hands. She can't leave it alone. Her hands are always busy doing something. And here's a detail, although they're not um, too blurry. Very self-conscious with her hands, in uh, which uh, we, we are just interpreting from the photographs. Look at these photographs. Um, in every photograph of her, <clears throat> there's some kind of gesture that um, many of them are stereotypically feminine, um, even the one in her old age where she's um, clutching a ring or uh, a handkerchief or something like that. She's very, very aware of her hands, and very strong hands, very capable, um, very sensitive hands. And she loved looking at hands. When she was in Spain, she was studying uh, the Spanish masters, particularly Velázquez uh, on the left and Murillo on the right, uh, and talks about their hands. She's, she was saying, oh, you know, when she first went to Spain, she was thrilled to see all the Velázquez. She was in Madrid, um, you know, because he had that loose painterly style that she uh, always gravitated toward. That was something that interested her. But after a while, she settled down in Seville, uh, had a studio there, began painting. Um, and she, you know, she, she was really critical of the hands. She said, in all of Velasquez's pictures, I can think of no beautiful hand. No, not one, and underlined. Maria's hands of the Saint Elizabeth, which is on the right here, are exquisite, but even in that picture, there is a boy scratching his head in the most grotesque manner. <laughs> Indeed, throughout, I think the Spanish school lack taste. <laughs> and you know, for someone who holds her own hands in these uh, very sort of delicate gestures, um, you can see why she would object to the, these kinds of hands. When she did her paintings in Spain, like the one of the Toreador that we were looking at before, she is trying for the most complex gestures. Look at this, um, of the guy holding his cigar and lighting it with the two, the two sets of fingers separated. And not that many people can do that. You know, it's not, not that easy. But he, she was examining, observing very, very closely um, the hand of her model, the hands of her model, and trying to find those telling gestures. This is, you know, trying in her head, trying to get at exactly how you would hold a cigar if you were lighting it, what that gesture was about, and studying um, the, the work of other artists in order to do it. When she found her mature style, when she became an Impressionist, and then ever after, hands are still equally, even more so, important to the composition, particularly the right hand. Because if you look at the, the three of these works, it's um, the hand, the most elaborate hand gestures are in the same place in the composition, all sort of um, in the lower left, which would be the right hand. Each one sort of a masterpiece of observation of that particular gesture. Playing the music, you know, I think, I think she was trying with her observation of hands and the attention paid to the depiction of hands, trying to get us to see the sense of touch. And in the case of the musician, trying not only to get us to see the touch, but hear the music. I don't know. Um, but certainly the hand of the woman with the tea service, that old, the 
very agile but refined fingers over age, over time, touching the porcelain of the tea set. And of course, the mother wringing out a cloth or a sponge in order to wash the baby. Very telling, very carefully observed, and very convincing hands. Then there's the no hands gambit. <coughs> Duranty talked about how you could just show a man coming from a tryst with his hands in his pockets, no hands, and knowing that he has just lost his true love. Here, the little girl, you don't see hands in either, in either place. You don't see hands in this particular portrait, photograph of Mary Cassatt. But equally telling, thinking about, and, and of course, the, the hand um, on the banjo, you're not seeing that hand, the left hand, carefully depicted. So balancing the depiction of the hand and the non-depiction of the hand. I like this co combination. It's the same model, same dress. As you can see, here she is with the red hair. She's getting the dress made over here and wearing it over here. In this one, she's got the delicate touch of holding a flower. And over here, no hands really to be seen, but gestures, very telling gestures. And most extraordinary, the dressmaker, whose hands she makes a living from, we cannot see, but we can imagine. The hands are so carefully observed that when you go back and look at these three versions of the banjo player, you can see that the daughter, or the, the girl, has her hand in a slightly different gesture in each one. Here she's leaning her chin on her hand. Here it's as if her hands are clasped together with, on the shoulder of her, presumably her mother. And here the hands are just lightly touching the shoulder. We think of these as being repeated, sort of by rote, and yet in each case, Cassatt is thinking differently about the hands and what they should be doing and what they should convey. Gender issues were just as thorny for women in the 19th century as they are today. Here's a very interesting image that combines the sense of touch of the hands holding the paper, and the sense of touch of the lips, the two most sensitive parts of the body. And for women, the, because their hands are smaller than men's, apparently scientific studies have shown that the smaller your hands are, the more, the, the more sensitive your fingertips are. The, the sensors are more concentrated. So women's hands would be more sensitive than men's hands. But in this case, she is making them large, like perhaps her own hands. Her hands were, for a woman, she was tall. She was like five, six or so. Seems to have had large, very strong hands. Uh, and here we have a woman with those kinds of hands. And it was noticed. So Félix Fénéon, who was uh, the symbolist writer about modern art at that time, when she exhibited the set of 10 color prints in 1891, he was, he was bowled over. He loved them. Um, he praised her, her use of the Japanese style, uh, but he also noted her blending of genders, um, describing the fine observation of female gestures, se oh, sealing a letter, turning to check the dressmaker's work, 
leaning her head against her babies. But interrupting the feminine with, quote, the beautiful masculine hands that Cassatt loves to give to her women. This, this back and forth between masculine and feminine that Cassatt was really aiming for, uh, the way she was trying to blend the Japanese uh, and, the, and the Western, the Asian and the Western, trying to arrive at a new interpretation of both of those. Fanon said that at first these large hands are jarring, especially against the soft babies, but ultimately the masculine and feminine lines combine to create unexpected arabesques. Um, the lines are what she was after. When she began showing her mother and child pictures, however, some critics, for instance, Huisman, who wrote about the Impressionist group, felt that her success in painting mothers and children, and particularly children, had to do with the fact that she was a woman, in that only a woman could paint mothers and children the way only a woman could actually handle children, could pin without pricking them. So okay, I mean, fine. <laughs> yes, it is true that smaller hands, women's hands, have more touch, more sensitivity. But even then, she was not happy that he attributed her success not to her skill, not to her thinking about touch, not to her trying, observing, and learning how to paint touch, but sweeping all of that aside, all of her accomplishments aside, and giving her credit for these beautiful pictures simply because she was a woman. Now, as we know, this, in some ways, essentialism can be and should be embraced because, yes, okay, she was a woman and she did want to glorify that. She wanted to take advantage of that. So yes, um, she could do the mothers and children because she was extra sensitive. But she also felt that she didn't want to imitate men, that she wanted to, um, you know, as one critic said, have women no passions of their own, no hatreds, no intellectual refinements and sensations peculiar to their sex. This is the criticism that women artists of this time, this is in the 1880s, were imitating men too much and not creating their original style. And so she, she took this to heart. She was trying to walk that fine line between masculine and feminine, uh, between imitating men, but not being, you know, not having her art be um, attributed just to the fact that she was a woman. When she did that Modern Woman mural, she wanted, actually she said, I want this to be a woman's work. I want this to be special to the fact that, a special tribute to modern women, the fact that I am a modern woman and I am painting this picture. She said, men, I have no doubt, are painted in all their vigor on the walls of other buildings. To us, the sweetness of childhood, the charm of womanhood, if I have not conveyed some sense of that charm, in one word, if I have not been absolutely feminine, then I have failed. So she wanted to have this sense of the feminine in her work without it being um, a backhanded um, insult to her skill and her accomplishment. She 
used pastel for her children. And to a certain extent, um, we can see that. Children are moving around, pastel is faster. This is something that, you, for sketches, pastel is a really good tool, is a really good medium to work in. But the touch of pastel may have greater significance than uh, we think of at first. In that, in terms of haptic communication, that is using touch to communicate between two people, between two creatures, but in this case, between two people. This is that sense of holding that Cassatt also perfected that it wasn't just the fingers, it wasn't just the hand gestures, but it was the communication, that sense of envelopment, and that sense of touch between mother and child that had much greater uh, physiological and psychological significance. In, particularly in um, the 20th century, experiments have been done to show that babies, children, and this can be duplicated with animals as well, who are not touched, who are not held, orphanages, hospitals, you know, those kinds of situations, those children suffer a condition that is called failure to thrive. Um, this uh, was particularly uh, investigated um, by a guy named Harry, a scientist named Harry Harlow, who did what is considered a very unethical experiment today, where he had monkeys, um, babies, monkeys, um, put with, not with real mothers, but with um, mannequins, uh, to resemble mothers that had uh, milk, had bottles of milk that the, the babies could eat from. Some of the mannequins were covered with terry cloth, with something soft, something that the babies could cling to and, and have the sense of touch. The others were just wire. Uh, they didn't have a, a soft, a, you know, a, much of a tactile, tactile sense. And it was the, ba the babies that grew up with the wire mothers that were um, sociopaths or were not able to adapt when they were put in with the community of monkeys. That touch actually is nurturing. It does cause uh, a child to thrive, to, um, to develop into um, a socialized adult. In Cassatt's case, she um, said that she liked painting children because they represented the future. This idea that the representing of children, the, the touch, the, the pastel uh, on the surface was like the sense of touch that a mother would nurture her child with. And these are, uh, and, and you know, the, the, the question that I'm always given is why did she do the mothers and children and so many children when she herself did not have children, did not give birth to children? But the answer is she had children. And these are her children. These are her nieces and nephews. They all spent time with her as babies and as um, growing up and as adults. This, these, her, the one on the left is her brother Alexander's daughter, Elsie, um, and on the right, um, her, two of her other brother's daughter, um, Ellen Mary, and uh, his son, Gardner. They did represent the future for her, and she did nurture them. And in applying the touch of the pastel, she made these images the images grow up, survive into the future as well, and the children who are depicted here did their part to make them survive. They then donated these works to museums 
they then had a role in making her, making the, the pastels have a future and making her have a future. In terms of lineage, and I'm using the word lineage deliberately, the line, she, she derives her pastel technique, not directly because she doesn't ever mention her, but Rosalba Carriera, uh, an Italian artist from the 18th century, a woman, uh, was, is credited with making pastel a major portrait medium in the 18th century. Rosalba Carriera um, influenced Maurice Canton de la Tour in the later part of the 18th century, whose work could be viewed in his hometown of Saint Canton, which is about 100 miles uh, um, north of Paris, where Cassatt visited and absolutely fell in love with his work. She um, loved his pastel technique and she then communicated her interest in pastel and the history of pastel to her other children who were the female art students of Paris. And I'm showing you here uh, on the far left two, there were many, many art associations in Paris, but two major ones for young art students uh, one of them called um, the American Girls Art Club, which is on the far left. It's now called Reed Hall and is part of Columbia University in Paris. It has survived. In the middle, um, it used to be called the Hostel for American Girl Students. It's now called the Foyer International des Étudiantes, still for women students, still in Paris, and now part of the Sorbonne. Um, she was a patroness of both of these organizations. She loved to go and be invited to go and lecture to them about art. Uh, she also established, and I don't know any details on this, we don't know, I mean it was just mentioned in an article about her, she established a scholarship so that they, those students, or worthy students, could go to um, Saint-Quentin to the museum there, the Musée Antoine Lécuyer, where the Maurice de um, the Saint-Quentin Saint Saint -Quentin de la Tour, where his pastels are housed. And we know, of course, about the finished pastels were, that were there, but in fact, not only were there finished pastels, but there were sketches. And when I think of Cassatt wanting these students to go there and study, I think of her thinking of the sketches of the hands. This would have been the perfect, the perfect thing for these young art students to learn from. Going back to these three pastels, she did them as a series or a part of a session. Uh, they were all turned over to her dealer at the same time. Uh, and in terms of her legacy, the one on the left, she donated to the state. Uh, it is now in the Musée d'Orsay. Um, the Luxem at the time, the museum was the Luxembourg, where the, the art of contemporary artists was collected. They had asked her for a work of art, uh, and she was not able to give it to them. But in 1897, she donated this pastel. The one in the middle, uh, she sold or gave to Sarah Sears, a very familiar um, patroness and artist from Boston, uh, and is now in the Metropolitan Museum. The one on the right um, uh, sold to another patron of hers, Alfred Pope, uh, the father of Theodate Pope, um, that you may know, and is now in the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. Her pastels then have survived, have lived on uh, in, in museum collections, as have her actual boxes of pastels. These she donated to Electra Havemeyer, who was the daughter of her best friend, Louisine Havemeyer. And Electra Havemeyer then founded the Shelburne Museum uh, in Vermont, 
which had an art school with it. And so the art students there used Mary Cassatt's pastels until um, they were then donated to the National Gallery. And of course, the uh, set that's here uh, at the MFA was given to Sarah Sears, the aforementioned Sarah Sears, who doesn't seem to have used it, but definitely kept it and passed it down through her family and finally to a museum. So in terms of the lineage, the legacy, the survival, the future, all of the terms that she used along with the touch and the drawing for, for nurturing, for the creative process, for allowing herself to live and through, you know, through the ages, all of these were based, as she would say, on her drawing. And even at the time, of course, yes, women may have a special touch with babies and whatnot, there was still always that idea that, well, maybe women weren't quite as good as the men. But in terms of her own relationship with someone like Degas, who loved to tease her with things like that, um, she remembered and she was honored by all of the times that he poked at her. Uh, he would say, oh, did you do that? He would say, I can't believe you do that. And finally, he said, no woman has a right to draw like that. <laughs> a compliment that she treasured and she passed on. We didn't hear it from Degas, we heard it from her. Um, it was something that meant the world to her. And it was because of her sense of touch. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, uh, the guy. Oh, we have a we have a microphone. Hi, I'm I'm wondering if you have any information you can share with us about her thought in choosing a paper. Did she prefer putting pastel on brown or white? Okay, good question. Um, yeah, as you can see, this paper is brown. It was originally blue. The, um, the new dyes that were being developed, better living through chemistry, um, in the 19th century turned out to be pretty fugitive. <clears throat> and actually, that was true of the blue pigment um, through, throughout history. Almost all pastels, if an artist chose a colored paper, they chose blue. But they're almost all now brown. So, um, so basically, she was choosing blue for her pastels. Did she have any discussions with Juilliard or that we have recorded work? Uh, bon Bernard or P hands? We don't have any. I know. I wish we did. Uh, the only mention of hands that we have is the one about Velazquez and Murillo and the Spanish and how they didn't have any taste. Uh, not in California. She, yeah, she was um, at. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know. No, I wish I could identify it. It doesn't. Yeah, yeah. I know, but she she had all of her work hanging around her. This was in her country house, uh, which was about 50 miles north of Paris. And, um, yeah. All right. Mr. Yeah. For, uh, thank, thank you for your lecture. It was wonderful. And thank you for enlightening us on her choice of subject matter, the children and, and the women. And um, did she have many students? And are there any students that we would recognize? Or who would be like the second tier female impressionists that are just kind of like under the wire, but were influenced by her? 
Well, probably the most um, famous woman artist who was the next generation who never, the two of them never got along and, and was not actually a student of hers, was C Cecilia Bow, because they uh, both were from Philadelphia. Uh, they actually painted several of the same people. Um, and, uh, seven, and Cecilia Bowes, of course, were done you know, 20, 30 years later uh, in many of the same poses. Uh, that Cassatt had done those those people. So she was very aware, and I, I really want to emphasize how famous Cassatt was, especially in this country. She, um, you know, the, the newspapers covered her. Um, the few times that she actually came to this country, she was deathly seasick, so she hated to make that trip. Um, so she didn't come often, but when she did, uh, she would be surrounded by reporters greeting her uh, when she got off the boat. And of course, she had a dealer here, Duron Ruel, um, had a, a New York branch. So he, he was, or that firm was making sure that her reputation was well known. Uh, in terms of other artists, um, you know, we really don't, they really are lost, not lost to history, but they are so unfamiliar to us. And she, we, to our knowledge, she never actually taught a, a particular artist. She didn't have a studio where artists would come for classes. She would lecture at the you know, art student um, residences. But she usually, when someone came to her for lecture, uh, for advice, for teaching, she would uh, pass them off to somebody else. Um, Pizarro was a good one because he spoke English, um, and they, you know, she would send them to her to Pizarro, and he was so good, he would he would be you know welcoming to to anyone. So, um, but yeah, I wish I, there are plenty of people who are imitated her, but not were not directly her students. How late in her life did she paint, and did her subject matter change over that time? Yeah, she painted um, until she was about 70. Um, in 1914, she um, began having cataract operations. Her eyesight was failing her. Um, and she had actual, actually several, which were not successful, and it probably is due, although you know you hate to diagnose someone, a historical figure. She did have diabetes, and she probably was just um, suffering from um, diabetic blindness. And 70, as you know, is not old. Uh, she could have, <laughs> she could have continued on uh, as an artist if she had had her eyesight. Uh, and she died at, at 82. So she could have had an, at least another decade of, of work, and she. Because of the diabetes, she died, again, relatively young um, in her early 80s. She could, you know, she was in otherwise, you know, she was very physical. She could have lived on if she hadn't had that. Oh, did her subject matter change? Um, well, it, it, it was always a kind of range of things, but what happened was her mother and child paintings were the best sellers. And so she, the dealers encouraged her to paint more mothers and children. And she, and people began coming to her for, for portraits, you know, the mother and child <coughs> portraits of them, which she did a limited number of. So she kind of, she was a, a little um, upset about that. She felt she kind of got trapped into the subject matter. Um, but she loved it. I mean, you know, the, the, the touch, you can tell that in her pastels. She loved the, you know, she would say the, the baby's flesh. It's so absorbing. Um, just to be able to create that effect was something that she really, really loved doing. So. Yes, she was very friendly with Bert Morisot. Uh, the two of them, and, and 
Morisot was also very welcoming of her to the group. Uh, they often would go and visit each other and, and sometimes paint uh, together or sketch, have a model and, and work together. Um, you know, they would, it, in Paris, they would go to exhibitions together. Uh, and it was a very social crowd. They would have dinner parties and, and whatnot. Uh, however, they were rivals. And like, you know, uh, you know, they were the two most visible women in that group. And so the critics played favorites. Oh, you know, Cassatt is much better than Morisot. And the other critics would say Morisot is much better than Cassatt. It, it was, you know, the same happened with Cecilia Bow in the American context. Um, you know, oh, Cecilia Bow is the greatest American painter. Uh, oh, no, Mary Cassatt is the greatest American. It, because, you know, that was always reduced. Even though there were many, many women painting, it was always reduced to the most visible ones. And they, you know, a kind of rivalry was manufactured for them. So. Any other? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks to Duranty, who really sort of put that into print, the idea that the hands, the gestures were, were to be exact. It, you know, you were supposed to study them, and if you looked at the hands, you could tell immediately what that person did for a living, or, you know, what their class, social class was, or, you know, all of those identifiers. And, and Duranty and Degas were very friendly, so definitely Duranty was thinking of Degas when he wrote that. And, and of course, Cassatt was very close to Degas. You know, the, I always say this, and people are like, oh, I never thought of that. Degas' mother was American, and he um, had visited his relatives in New Orleans, um, and he could speak a little bit of English, but when he was in New Orleans, he painted the, the Cotton Office, which was then exhibited in one of the uh, Impressionist exhibitions. And, and critics actually uh, talked about him as an American. So when Cassatt comes on the scene, they are actually, you know, compatriots. Um, and Degas' two American uncles lived in Paris. They were Southerners, and so they were very... Um, <coughs> pro-South in the Civil War, very vocal uh, in that regard. And his two brothers went and worked for the uncle in New Orleans, so lived in New Orleans for a while. Both of the brothers married American women. One actually named America, if you can believe that. <laughs> and, and eventually brought them back, and they lived in Paris. So the, you know, we think of Degas as the quintessential Frenchman, but he, like Cassatt, was surrounded by American relatives. Um, and, you know, they were always, um, you know, sort of lumped together for that reason. But they, in fact, they actually liked each other and, you know, were, got along. And, you know, Cassatt just thought he was the best, the greatest artist of, of his era. And for her, to have that relationship was very, very special. And any, you know, any compliment that he gave her, no matter how backhanded, she was thrilled. <laughs> um, any other? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>